July 9, 1668, Archbishop James Sharp, a man with many enemies, is sitting in his coach at the Royal Mile in the Scottish city of Edinburgh. A man named James Mitchell sneaks up to the carriage and fires a pistol at Sharp. Only the bullet hit Sharp's friend, Bishop Andrew Honeyman. The bishop took a hit to his hand, but he survived. As for Sharp, he was eventually assassinated in 1679. Today is not the day to get into religious squabbles on Scotland back in those days. Instead, we want to focus on one of the more horrendous instruments of torture ever used, and that was one brought out on many occasions in many countries. Before we get into the various iterations of this very frightening contraption, we'll first finish the story we started. Mr. Mitchell's tale is unlike most others in that he must have had an incredibly high pain tolerance. It took until 1674 for Mitchell to be caught. It was the brother of Archbishop Sharp, Sir William Sharp, that did it. Mitchell was taken to a dungeon on the small island of Bass Rock off the Scottish mainland and told that if he confessed, his life would be spared. On February 12, 1674, Mitchell admitted his guilt in front of the High Court of Justice and was told his punishment was to have one of his hands chopped off. The courts later said no one actually said they'd spare his life, and so Mitchell recanted his confession. That led him to being fixed with the boot. Something that Mitchell later wrote was an extreme inquiry of torture. He was tortured on several occasions so that he might again confess to the crime, but it seems even though he passed out at least once from the pain, he never did admit to the assassination attempt again. Mitchell wrote about his case in detail and mentioned being tortured with the boot, but he didn't go into details as to what it felt like. There is, however, a picture in existence that shows what the Scottish boot looked like. What we can see from the sketch is what looks like a fairly simple device. Boards of wood surrounded both the victim's lower legs, but there's enough space to hammer wooden wedges down the sides. The picture also shows a long-handled mallet with which the wedges would be hammered down. This was useful when a confession was required because the wedges would be forced down in increments, although it seems before Mitchell's bones were crushed he passed out, which didn't bode well for a confession. Mitchell was eventually executed by hanging on the 18th of January 1678. It seems in terms of torture boots, the ones fitted to Mitchell weren't the worst that have been used throughout history. A long history such boots had, too. Take, for example, the story of Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Catholic military order, the Knights Templar. His story is a long one, too, but let's just say his crusades came to an end after he was accused of various crimes against the church in the early 1300s. After extreme interrogation, he admitted that the Templars engaged in some strange initiation rituals, including denying Christ and trampling on the cross. Just like Mitchell had done, de Molay confessed to certain crimes during torture but later recanted his confessions. One of the tortures he endured was having his feet roasted above a fire. There were some various ways this could be done, but sometimes it involved putting the person's foot inside some kind of device and then held above the flames. This was, of course, agonizing for the recipient of the torture, but it was slow enough to give the person time to confess. To cut a long story short, the Molay, like many other Templars, were burned at the stake, and that was the end of the Knights Templar. There were different kinds of punishments similar to this over the centuries, but the outcome was usually the same. That was the legs and feet either being crushed or partly crushed, or the feet and legs being heated up inside a kind of boot. And that's exactly what happened to Dermot O'Hurley. He was a 16th century Roman Catholic Archbishop in Ireland who was eventually executed under the orders of Queen Elizabeth I. The Pope and England weren't exactly getting along those days, so O'Hurley's job was always a risky one. He was eventually arrested and accused of taking part in the Roman Inquisitions. Sure, the Catholics were known for their own brutal tortures during the Inquisitions, hence the boot gets its name from the Spanish Inquisitions, but the other side weren't exactly saints either. In the book History of Ireland in the Reign of Elizabeth, O'Hurley's fate is described in lurid detail. His interrogators first asked him to renounce his beliefs, but he wasn't about to do that. Then he was told, if we cannot convince you by argument, we will make you quit your false law and embrace our religion or feel our power. He was then tied to a stake and his feet were bound in a pair of thick leather boots. According to the writer, they were filled with water, salt, bitumen, tallow, pitch, and oil, after which they were roasted over a fire. We don't know if what the writer said as next is an exaggeration, but we wouldn't want to put the torture to the test. He said that slowly the skin, flesh, muscles, and pretty much everything else were cooked off, leaving just the bones. Sounds like something from a horror movie, and to be honest, the description does sound a bit like Catholic propaganda. That's because of what the writer says next. The martyr, having his mind filled with thoughts of God and holy things, never uttered a word, but held out to the end of the torture with the same cheerfulness and serenity of countenance he had exhibited at the commencement of sufferings. As if flying the heat of the summer sun, he were lying in a dainty bed upon a soft pillow beneath an overshadowing tree with spreading leafy branches, and besides a rivulet humming with gentle murmur through fragrant lilies. Something doesn't sound quite right here, and so you won't be surprised to hear that the writer says the interrogators failed to break O'Hurley's unconquerable spirit. The book was written in 1903, so we guess you could get away with not letting the facts get in the way of a good old tale back then. Still, there are more accounts of the torture mentioning his flesh falling from the bones inside of boats. We just doubt that he endured all that 
with the equipoise of someone enjoying the luxuries of a soft bed. We have no idea what state his feet and legs were in when he was executed in June 1584, but in his last words he mentioned that he'd been treated savagely even by the standard of the times, saying, they have proceeded against me in all points cruelly contrary to their own laws. Even if O'Hurley wasn't as laid back about the torture of the boot as some people have said, he almost certainly was tortured this way, as were many others in Europe back then. The French had a version of the boot similar to the one we've just described, although it sometimes differed in that the boiling water was soaked through the boot rather than poured into it. Then there was the story of another Scotsman who also got the boot over the matter of his religious beliefs. This man was named John Spirrell, and unlike other people in this video, he was tortured by two kinds of boots. He was arrested on November 12, 1680, accused by the High Court of Justiciary of treason and supporting an uprising by the militant Presbyterian Covenanters. Presbyterians, who were reformers within Protestantism, were subjected to a lot of persecution back then in Scotland. We found a book about Scottish martyrs published in 1871. It details what happened to Spruill and some others that were tortured at the same time as him. In one part, the book states, the presses told Mr. Spruill that if he would not make a more ample confession than he had done and sign it, he behooved to underlie the torture. Spruill countered, saying torture was not even lawful, and anyway, he had nothing to confess. The hangman that struck the boots on his legs then proceeded to hammer in five wedges. In pain, Spruill was asked if he knew anything about the plot to blow up a certain abbey or the plot to kill the Duke of York. He denied knowing anything and stated again that he was not part of any kind of rebellion. This is what the writer said happened next. When nothing could be expiciated by this, they ordered the old boot to be brought, alleging this new one used by the hangman was not so good as the old, and accordingly it was brought, and he underwent the torture a second time and adhered to what he had said before. So this guy got two kinds of boots because the newer kind was apparently not very effective. The hangman struck the wedges again, but the pain wasn't enough to make Mr. Spiral confess. He was, however, not exactly sitting back enjoying his day out. He had to be carried back to his cell, and even though he needed medical attention, he was denied a visit by the surgeon. The writer of the book admits that the boots used were not in existence when he wrote the book in 1871, although his research led him to believe that the torture could have at least broken the shin bone. He also said the boot was a kind of torture imported from France, where it was known as Le Brodkin. Spiral, by the way, was almost sent off to work as a slave in the plantations of the New World, but he stayed in Scotland and fought for his innocence. He won in the end and became a successful businessman. As for Le Brodkin, one of the best accounts we have is one of a man named Francois Ravaillac. In 1610, he assassinated King Henry IV of France by stabbing him in his coach. It went without saying back then that he was going to die in the worst way imaginable. But the question was, did he have accomplices? To know the answer, the authorities had to torture him. The registers of the French parliament kept a record of this. When the first wedge was driven into his boot, he cried out, God have mercy upon my soul. He screamed louder after the second wedge was driven in, shouting, God, I accept these torments and satisfaction for my sins. He fainted after the third wedge went in and couldn't be brought around by some slaps in the face and the wine poured down his throat. That must have hurt. But this is how the actual execution was described. Before being drawn and quartered, he was scalded with burning sulfur, molten lead, and boiling oil and resin, his flesh then being torn by pincers. Now we head over to Germany where the boot took on a different form, one that was arguably even more gruesome. This boot had some sharp studs connected to the inside. Unlike the shin boots we've described so far, this boot sometimes covered both sides of the feet. To understand how it worked, imagine two studded plates, one that went over the top of the foot and the other below it. After it was secured, a crank would be turned so the two plates came together, and after enough turning, the foot would be completely crushed. Still, while such instruments of torture existed and were later part of exhibitions around the world, if they were ever used, we don't know because the written accounts don't exist. For instance, the Earl of Shrewsbury collected such devices and wrote about them in the 1893 book, Collection of Torture Instruments from the Royal Castle of Nuremberg. That book describes many devices used to crush feet, toes, shins, legs, but actual documents covering the tortures are not easy to find. It's the same story with a similar torture that was said to have happened in China. This was called the Kia Quen, and it involved three pieces of bamboo being connected with a rope around a person's foot. When the rope was pulled, the boards would tighten, and so this was also used to extract confessions from people rather than kill them. We could couldn't find much information about that, but we had more luck finding stories about a kind of boot torture that happened in India in the mid-19th century. In an 1856 report to British Parliament titled Torture in Madras, a whole list of tortures were mentioned, including some very unique ones such as this, placing the carpenter beetle or other gnawing insect, or some stinging reptile confined within a coconut shell on the navel or still more sensitive part of the body, causing great torment. Pretty much the whole gamut of tortures were mentioned in that report, with some leading to death or disablement. The complaint goes on to say that the torture was ignored, despite the British government and the government of Madras knowing it happened and was illegal.
illegal. The British East India Company knew about it too, and stood accused of willfully and disgracefully concealing it. That's because they were often behind it. One of those tortures was called kitty, and consists of tightening sticks or boards around a person's fingers or feet, and then tightening them with a rope. It was said to have been used mostly by local tax collectors, although police sometimes used it as a way to extract confessions. Riots were common back then. In some reports, it was compared to the boot, but like the Chinese version of the torture, the device looked more like a sandal. Now you need to watch The Blood Eagle, Worst Punishments in the History of Mankind, or have a look at this.